<clears throat> okay, so uh, he, he was born 90 years ago in 1931 on, uh, on this day, the 3rd of April, and he died in 1997, as I said, uh, in, a, in a car accident just like Raymond Abraham, who also died in a car accident, and probably there are other, other architects, or, you know, they don't have to be architects, of course, but uh, unfortunately, cars um, are not just bringing us pleasure, but also pain. <clears throat> this is the man. Uh, this was the man. Uh, well, they say, I don't know, it's some kind of a written or unwritten rule that the length of the tie should be, uh, you know, that the bottom of the tie should reach the, the belt. Well, in, in his case, <clears throat> although Italians do know how to dress and they are usually very elegant, but his uh, tie is, uh, you know, much shorter, as opposed to <clears throat> the tie of the ex-president of the United States, who was always longer and always went beyond the you know the level of the of the belt anyway sorry for this prosaic uh, uh, you know intermezzo. so <clears throat> behind you see a drawing by him and you are going to see other other drawings he drew a lot uh, <clears throat> he, uh, Aldo Rossi drew a lot and I think he drew very very well and he has a very uh, uh, almost a unique uh, way of, of uh, externalizing thoughts uh, about architecture, both uh, poetical and sometimes uh, rigorous, uh, colorful, uh, playful, uh, with a certain uh, uh, sophisticated infantilism, if I can say so, but we'll arrive at his drawings. Um, He designed also that watch. <clears throat> you know, these uh, these successful architects, they um, they are also sometimes commissioned, and, and he was commissioned, and Michael Graves was commissioned, and other architects commissioned to to design, uh, you know, uh, uh, sellable uh, objects. So here it is, uh, himself making, uh, I guess, uh, publicity for his own watch. I mean, the one <clears throat> the one that he he designed. Here he is, he received the Pritzker, Pritzker Prize in 1990, uh, together with his wife. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, well, there is much to say really about, uh, about postmodernism in, in, in architecture. I, uh, uh, I personally have, um, I don't know, I don't know if I am, I am uh, objective it happens that I worked for a while uh, for Paolo Portoghesi uh, in Rome, <clears throat> who was also uh, associated with postmodernism. And in fact, he he was the director, the first director of the uh, uh, biennial in Venice. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I am still uncomfortable about what is called postmodernism because because of it's uh, not always sufficient digestion of, of history. But in the case of Aldo Rossi, we are dealing with a special uh, special architect. He was immersed in history, but he was able to find his own language, so to speak. <clears throat> as, uh, as Peter Eisenman said, always try to find your language, a language. And uh, uh, Aldo Rossi found a language, uh, his specific language. Now, you agree with it or not, uh, this remains to be discussed, but uh, he, he, he found his way, so to speak. And as you can see, you know, his way brought him uh, whatever the word success uh, might mean. Some drawings. I like his drawings very much <clears throat> because they are lyrical, they are poetical, they are an architect's drawings, yes, but um, they, 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 are, they, are, they, are, they are lyrical and, uh, you know, they are explorations. Explorations, I would say, towards his own language, his, towards his own architectural language. Here we see, and this is very, very often the case with him, 
collage of various projects by him. Uh, not, a, not necessarily a rational or rationalistic uh, collage. Sometimes fragments of his projects are uh, overlapping uh, kind of in a disorderly way, but not always. <clears throat> he also combines, I think he likes very much Giorgio Morandi, the great uh, Italian painter uh, and uh, engraver, uh, <clears throat> because what we see here is, is kind of something from Morandi. We see, you know, uh, domestic objects and, uh, in, 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 in the proximity of buildings. And in fact, uh, as you can see in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in this drawing, the, the, the domestic object is actually bigger, much bigger than, than the building. So this reversal of, of scale and this, uh, you know, representational surrealism, I think is, uh, could be uh, fruitful. And uh, uh, I personally am an, ad an adversary of, of, of the, the ob so-called objective linear uh, perspective, <clears throat> the one that is done manually, because I think reality is much more complex. Uh, for example, <clears throat> in the Middle Ages, if someone, uh, let's say you had a friend and <clears throat> you depicted that friend in, 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 uh, in a perspectival, uh, representation, you showed your friend, even if he was very far away, big, because you liked him, he was your friend. On the other hand, if you had a neighbor who was your enemy, even if he was in the, in the, in the foreground, you'd, you'd, make him, you'd make him small, you'd draw him small. In other words, the, the psychic reality, the qualitative reality is more complex and subtle than the so-called objective one, where everything is controlled by reason. So I like his drawings, you know, this, uh, what are they? Uh, the, you know, there are some perspectives here, but all in all, it's, it's a, 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 you know, a, a very, it is a free drawing. <clears throat> uh, but it depends, you know, he has all kinds of drawings. He had many exhibitions. There are books with the sketchbooks of Aldo Rossi. I like this, this kind of drawings, you know, where he is uh, cryptical almost, you know, diagrammatic, but, but his diagrams are not cold because the, he uses colors. Uh, there is something uh, uh, primeval and archaic uh, and, uh, and, and in his drawings reminding one of, of, of um, you know, a certain, uh, uh, well, primitivism, but this is, if I am to use an oxymoron, this is a sophisticated primitivism. In essence, I think he is trying to capture or recapture something of the spirit of childhood. It's, it's an architecture which is uh, exploring the less explored childness or childishness in architecture. I remember what Picasso said that he learned to paint like Raphael in four years, but it took, it took him a, a lifetime to learn to paint like a child. <clears throat> to do architecture like a child is very uncommon. Uh, but uh, although <laughs> Although uh, here I, I could say that uh, maybe uh, the many architects are actually childish, but, but childish in the, in the wrong sense of the word, in the good sense of the word, there, there aren't too many. And I think Rossi was one of them. Uh, again, this kind of perspectival drawing, which is, you know, uh, freehand, uh, it's done manually, but it, it's a sketch. But I, I, I like these sketches because I think they evoke more than, than just a, an objective uh, perspective that is coldly so. And, and it's more than just buildings, you know, it's, you see here various, uh, it's onirical, you know, it's dreamlike. It's, uh, it, it shows the, the artistic side of Aldo Rossi. And I think that artistic side should be enhanced and underlined because it frees the spirit. 
there are there are architects who be <clears throat> who begin their projects through painting. Uh, they just paint and not in not in a so-called rational way. They just paint, you know, sometimes in abstract ways, like uh, Will Alsop. Uh, or furiously, like Massimiliano Fuxas. So it, it's possible to do architecture uh, uh, starting in a, in, a, in a tumultuous way with a lot of color and with expressing emotions. <clears throat> this is a study for the cemetery that he built and we are going to see it in detail. Uh, these explorations, you know, we look with powerful uh, shadows and uh, it, 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 the drawing is, 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 is a good artwork in itself, even if my, it might not have so-called objective uh, truth. <clears throat> but then we, we wouldn't ask an artwork to have an objective truth, would we? <clears throat> Subjectivity is unavoidable in art and is even to be uh, uh, promoted and applauded. And even the architect, look at this drawing. You know, I, I, I personally value much more this kind of drawing than one that is coldly, uh, you know, uh, executed and uh, traced mathematically. Of course, there are drawings like that um, as well, which have value. <clears throat> but, but here, you, you, we also see the emotion. We see the emotion of the architect and that emotion has nothing to do with a commercial rendering. This is not a rendering. This is an exploration in artistic terms of an architectural theme. It's a big difference. This one also is not a rendering, but it's very evocative because it speaks about the spirit of the building, the spirit of the architecture and not necessarily about the literal uh, truth, uh, so on, the objective truth. I mean, look at this drawing, you know, you know, someone might say this is nonsense. You know, what are these broken uh, buildings, you know, falling you know, near a vessel and, well, it's his mental state, you know, it's his, uh, uh, his exploration and, uh, I really like these drawings. These drawings tell us something about his, uh, um, you know, preoccupations. Or this with the Teatro del Mundo, you know, uh, the floating, uh, uh, you know, uh, theater that he built in Venice, and you are going to see it with notations, with writings on the sky and. Uh, you know, these are artworks, but they are artworks which evoke the architecture he built. This is, a, you know, a, a, well, this is almost a rendering, but even this is, you know, a little bit different, you know, with, with, the, with the way <clears throat> this is a study for the building in, uh, in Berlin an apartment building or a complex of apartment buildings. It, it even, it, it, it continues to have, even though it is uh, more uh, accurately uh, built, uh, uh, traced, but, but it, 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 it still has an artistic quality. I think the drawings of Aldo, Aldo Rossi are very uh, relevant to his work uh, in general. And they do belong to architecture, even those which appear to be more so-called artistic. Peter Eisenman thought that actually a drawing uh, is, is more architecture than the built work. I'm not so sure about that, but, but what he wanted to say, I think, is that the drawing contains and expresses the ideality of the building and the idea of the building, perhaps in a better way than the built work, because the built work needs to respond to certain necessities. But I still think that the great challenge is, in the end, the built work. 
I like this drawing, you know, it's, it's again, it's a collage, you know, we see silhouettes of animals, of horses, we see, um, you know, fragments of some of his buildings. It's, it's this mixture of, of various things that he thought of and he, he built actually. I personally think we can learn from Aldo Rossi to, <clears throat> to free our spirit uh, graphically as well. Because I think there are latent energies within ourselves that need to be uh, even discovered. You know, because the rationalist mode of, of approaching architecture, in my opinion, is very dangerous because it doesn't uh, open up new ways of doing architecture, because there are uh, hidden within ourselves immense uh, creative energies, which, which the rational, uh, you know, uh, well-tempered, so to speak, uh, way of, of uh, conceiving a building uh, doesn't, doesn't explore and doesn't bring to the surface. And that is a great loss, I think. Again, another, you know, rather artistic drawing, uh, but, but with explorations, you see a chair in the foreground, then some cabins that he built. Um, you know, th these are uh, preoccupations that he had in 1983 when he made this drawing. Obviously, he enjoyed making these drawings. And it's interesting that he has, you know, here is a Coke, and a pack of cigarettes and a pencil. And then, you know, not much, much bigger, the buildings themselves, kind of on a table almost, all of them together. This is uh, the plan of the competition that he won for this cemetery, and you are going to see it. Uh, a building he built in Japan, um, you know, you might say that there is something a little bit narcissistic here in the sense that he is uh, continuously externalizing his, uh, his obsessions having to do with his work. But, you know, there were great artists who painted themselves, uh, you know, uh, uh, endlessly like Rembrandt or Dürer or others, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to, 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 to uh, create something new without having a, a strong uh, sense of yourself, even if that self is, um, in a way, uh, questioning uh, itself, you know, in a Hamletian mode. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it has been said that you cannot become selfless unless you have a big ego first. So it's possible there is some paradoxical truth here. In the French, the French say le fait c'est moi, meaning uh, the effect is me, but equally you could say le fait c'est nous, the effect is us. And between me and us appears to be an abyss or a long distance, but it depends. I think the more, the closer we bring them, the better. If we can bring the 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 the, the, uh, the moi, meaning me uh, in connection closer to to us, uh, the singular uh, closer to the plural, the private closer to the public, the better. And I think this is the challenge of architecture: to bring together the private and the public, buildings and projects. 1960, this villa in Versilia, he worked with Leonardo Ferrari. Uh, so he was 27 years old. Uh, a very surprising building actually. And I, I, like, I like this modernistic uh, side of Aldo Rossi at the beginning. He was not yet touched by, uh, you know, historicism and I, I think this building is is uh, almost astonishing knowing his work in general. Maybe the influence of this architect Leonardo Ferrari was felt, I don't know. But I like this 
this early work by by Rossi. Rossi before Rossi, because he he, he was not yet the Aldo Rossi that we know. Uh, maybe there are here some influences from various people. I see strangely even some resemblance. I look at the plan and somehow I think of, of uh, early house by Peter Eisenman. There are maybe some influences, at least in the representation, uh, coming from Adolf Loss, perhaps. Although the architecture is, um, you know, in a way less uh, uh, less symmetrical or rigid. But it's a fine building, it really is. Uh, and the interior also has movement. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a dogmatic building. I think the, the early works of, of the masters can be fascinating, you know, because it's, it's like Le Corbusier before Le Corbusier Aldo Rossi before Aldo Rossi, Frank Lloyd Wright before Frank Lloyd Wright, in other words. Of course, they were the same people, but, but, but they were before they became the ones we know. And uh, the early works say something about them in an unspoiled way, maybe with problems, yes, but uh, I, I find uh, the early works of architects very interesting. A competition for the monument here. It wasn't quite clear to me what uh, it was about, 1962. But I like the the graphic representation, very abstract, very very uh, very free of any unnecessary elements. And some element, uh, some parts you recognize in some works later, like these steps here, and uh, yes, the the the, the clear uh, the clear symmetry. And here we see again a, a kind of a you know poetical drawing of of a section through through the monument they designed. But here we have Aldo Rossi and his partner working before uh, allowing uh, history to step in. He built in 1964 this bridge for the triennial in Milan. Uh, you see again the geometry is very resolute, the triangle, the structure. Um, so I guess he achieved some form of success rather early since he was 31 when he when he built this. A monumental fountain, a segregate in 1965 already there are elements here announcing his work. He, 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 uh, here we, we have already some elements of the, of the grammar, so to speak, the architectural grammar that uh, Aldo Rossi uh, used and in a way invented. Children, children draw primary, you know, um, I mean, you know, primal forms and they use primal colors and, and they do so before they actually learn geometry. And how do you explain it? You know, it's, you know, a, a child, if you ask a child to draw a window, will most surely make a square with a cross in the center. And, and or if you ask to, to, to draw a house, it will have an elevation with a square and then a triangle representing the roofing. And, but, but they do so before learning geometry. And how do you explain it? A competition for a district, I think, housing 1966, yes. Now, there is a paradoxically somehow because Italians uh, are supposed to be, you know, uh, temperamental and, uh, you know, uh, they are Latins. But rationalism is uh, very well rooted in the architectonic culture of, uh, of Italy. 
this is a, a large uh, uh, complex of uh, apartment buildings that he built together with Carlo Aimonino. And I will show you what Carlo Aimonino did and what uh, Aldo Rossi did. Uh, they, 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 uh, they worked together. So this is in Milan. Uh, and uh, it's, it's hard to tell, you know, on one hand, I, I like Rossi more. On the other hand, I like Carlo Aimonino more. So we will take a look at the buildings. Uh, the ones by Rossi are more uh, primal and, uh, and, uh, and uh, in a way less free. Uh, this is by Aldo Rossi. You know, it has the power of, of, of persistence, you know, the, the rhythm of the structural elements and then uh, the, the, very, the very long continuous line. There, are, there is power here, architectonic power. On the right, you have Carla, Carlo Aimonino, who is more free, maybe less, uh, 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 I don't know how to say, I almost felt like saying maybe ideal, less ideologically charged. This is an architecture that uh, the, the, the one that Aldo Rossi did that is, uh, um, I don't know if I can describe well what I'm trying to say. In a way it's more so-called powerful than what uh, Carlo Aimonino did, but what Carlo Aimonino did, in, he did is in a way more, uh, uh, I have to be careful here with the words. Um, it, it is probably a little bit more predictable, but the risk of Aldo Rossi, the risk that Aldo Rossi took was to, to, to uh, in a way, represent his, wo his world, the child's world. You know, this, this kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, regularity, and you see here the window that, that I, I was mentioning uh, as being the window that a child would draw, you would have nothing of this sort with Carla Aimonino. So you have here two different conceptions about what architecture is or could be or should be. But it's, it's interesting, you know, it's interesting that you have uh, two Italian ar architects, probably approximately of the same age, working so differently and in such a close proximity to each other in Milan. A design for a town hall in Scandici in 1968. We, we see already uh, steps towards his uh, graphic uh, manner or manner in which he began to uh, express his ideas and to explore. Also the appearance of uh, symmetry, you see here in the plan a very strong uh, uh, axis and symmetry is going to play a significant role. Very strangely maybe Bruno Cevi, the, the important uh, Italian uh, critic and theorist, uh, he wrote against symmetry. He said that modern architecture cannot be symmetrical. It has to be asymmetrical. But here we have Aldo Rossi, uh, yes, a modern architect until he became a so-called postmodern architect who used symmetry copiously. An ossuary and the cemetery of San Cataldo in Modena. This I have seen myself, I visited and I think is a an important work by uh, by Aldo Rossi. There are also beautiful drawings done by him uh, representing his ideas for this cemetery. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, the central piece, so to speak. It's a cube. It's, it's uh, very primal. It's, uh, you know, some I think is, 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 is too childish in a way because it's too explicitly um, I mean, it's too predictable with the with the with the fenestrations, the windows, the, the the openings into the walls. It's regular, is this cube? But I think it's it's a quest for, 
something that maybe even uh, uh, Boulle search for, for that uh, uh, primal quality of volume zero of architecture, which in this case would be a, a kind of justifiable because it's about Domus Eterna. Uh, the, the, it's a cemetery. It's about eternity. It's about death. But, but it's, it's not morbid. Although the geometry he uses could make one a little bit uncomfortable, but he uses colors. And uh, now we, we, we just saw the apartment building in Milan that uh, Aldo Rossi built. And now we see a cemetery that is actually not very different. If you look at these uh, long uh, buildings, they're not really very different from what he be. So, you know, maybe we, we can speculate. He is for, was for Aldo Rossi, the frontier between, the, the, between life and death so, so thin, you know, um, it's something to reflect on perhaps. Is the, is the city of the dead. This is what it is. And uh, these drawings uh, evoke this, you know, in, a, in a, an enticing graphic manner. I like this, uh, you know, the, the, the drawing submitted for the competition. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a rather unusual way of, of, uh, of uh, representing one's ideas, but, but it is a creative one and, uh, and he won and he built it. I personally, uh, if, I, if I'm allowed to have an advice for, for, for the students, explore other ways to express your ideas. Do not become trapped in the commercial rendering or the, you know, even the prescribed requirements of the, of the, of the, of the program you work with. You know, there are, there are other ways to explore architecture in a more intimate and more personal way. And, and in this sense, from Aldo Rossi, we can learn a lot. Why shouldn't the drawing be like this, you know, cryptical, poetical, mysterious, uh, you know, uh, trying to capture the spirit of the buildings and not necessarily the, the you know, the, the, uh, the, the so-called objective uh, uh, you know, uh, appearance. Because the, the so-called objective appearance is only partially true because subjectivity also plays a role. How, are, how else can we arrive at the spirit of the work if we, if we are only seduced by, uh, by appearance? A design for City Hall in, from 1972. Again, look at this drawing. The, <clears throat> the, you know, the uh, rational mind and the, the objectivist would protest, would say, this is, this is, you know, okay, maybe it's a nice drawing, but, but you know, it's not correct. It's not uh, the, the very rigorously drawn. It's a sketch. But this sketch, I think, expresses very well the spirit of the work. And the, I, I was very, very surprised to read that actually, actually Einstein who was a scientist, not a poet, although he was a scientist who achieved poetry, if I can say so. In his, uh, in his theories, but he didn't value facts too much. He didn't believe in facts. He even said, you know, if, uh, if, if uh, facts do not match the theory, change the facts. Um, a primary school in Faniano, Olona in 1972, perfect symmetry, isn't it? Bruno Zevi would probably would have protested, but 
he built it. Here it is. And it has something, uh, you know, uh, it, it is kind of strange because it is an architecture which is very explicit, very clear, very willful in a way, but exactly at the point where it achieves, uh, you know, almost an excessiveness of what I mentioned, it falls into, into, into its opposite and it becomes irrational, almost surreal. Uh, there is some kind of a surrealism that you arrive at through excessive, um, you know, symmetry or, or pre, uh, deter, predetermination or willfulness. It's, it's because the opposites sometimes attract and one generates the other one. I mean, even this picture with the children, you know, it's, it's like in a surrealist movie somehow. Well, there are also you know, certain degrees of freedom within the building, but not too many. I don't know. I am curious what the children thought of this school, which is kind of an unusual school. They seem to be happy, but then children are always happy uh, unless they are unhappy. Single family homes, 1977. He loved rhythm, rhythm, as you can see, there is a strict rhythm here. Uh, and this primal architecture, one could uh, protest uh, being a little too, you know, uh, uh, referential to a certain historicism and, and this, you know, uh, very static symmetry. But, but static symmetry is not necessarily a sign of uh, of dogma, it could be actually uh, uh, an attempt to crucify, so to speak, the, the primordial snake. I don't know if I, uh, if I explained uh, something through what I said, but I had this intuition that, you know, sometimes what appears to be rigid, but is charged spiritually, that is not a sign of dogma. It's a sign of uh, of actually intense tension in trying to uh, uh, to arrive at that uh, so-called axis mundi that uh, Mircea Eliade talked about. Teatrino Scientifico. I like these drawings and now he is, he is Aldo Rossi. Aldo Rossi became Aldo Rossi. Uh, but 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 postmodernism also is knocking at the door, and we see we see something we didn't see at the beginning. We see the arrival of history, of the historical precedents. In the early house or houses that he built, this was absent, not any longer. Welcome towards the end of the 20th century, and and this had a. In a way, it was understandable because I imagine people were afraid to step into the third millennium without looking back into history. This, the floating 250 seat Teatro del Mondo and, and Triumphal Arts, both built for the Venice Biennial. Uh, we see now some preparatory sketches. But what he built is very similar to what you see sketched here. And you'll see it floating on the waters of Venice. Here it is, but the resolution of the picture is not great. Sorry, uh, here it is. Uh, in essence, the, the project is very simple. Uh, you see the plan and the elevation and it was supposed to float on water, a nice idea. 
elevation and section of Teatro del Mondo. So where is this building? Pardon? Where is this building? In Venice. Okay. In Venice. It was built for the Venice Biennial of architecture. But it was built on the water? Well, it was not built on the water, it was built on, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, carried on, put, maybe it was built on that ship, I don't know, but uh, certainly not on water, I mean, not, not on water, literally. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. In this building here that you see, Tadao Ando did, uh, uh, you know, rather important work. The only work he did in Venice. Um, yeah, this is a building by Longena. It's an interesting uh, uh, collage of various buildings here with uh, with uh, the Aldo Rossi building on the on the on the ship. So here. But Tadawando didn't build the whole building, but he, he, he was asked to uh, re, uh, redesign the interior of this building. So we have uh, Ando and we have uh, in colors uh, Aldo Rossi. It's an interesting idea to have a, a theater float, you know, of course, it's a building that, uh, you know, is rather ephemeral, but it, it, is a, it is a commentary, it is a metaphor for life in a way, you know, what is life? We are all, uh, you know, ephemeral, we live for a while and then we die. And this theater, it is the theater of the world, um, and this theater of the world is actually a uh, a representation, a metaphorical and poetical representation of the fragility of life, in a way. Beautiful picture, isn't it? An architect must dream. Of course, to remain at the level of the dream is not sufficient you have to strive to build that dream. But if you don't dream, there is a risk that what you build is not, is not going to move too many hearts. Uh, I think the great architects, as Frank Lloyd Wright said, are poets. And being poets, they cannot reject the world of the dream. The dream is important. It's not so small, you see the silhouettes, uh, you know, the human silhouettes here, it's, it's rather big. Now, 1979, these are, uh, he was invited uh, together with other important architects to build apartment buildings in Berlin. Berlin has three, uh, three colonies with uh, apartment buildings built by famous architects. They had one in the 1930s, then one in 1950s, and now in the 1980s, 70, at the end of 70s, early 80s. And uh, Rossi built uh, quite a large, uh, uh, you know, block, uh, I mean, several buildings, uh, maybe more than most architects who were invited, and some very important architects were invited. Tomorrow, I will also talk about Bruno Taut, who also contributed to the a colony with uh, uh, apartment buildings from 1930s. But this one is from the 1980s. And we see uh, this sketch, this drawing that we already saw. And this is the building as it was built. But he built in two different locations. This is one of them, but it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a big building as you can see. This is the other one. Unafraid to use, uh, you know, rather unconventionally color. 
and uh, I'm happy he used Kala. The paradigmatic primal window. The triangle which he loves. This building is not by him, he only built this. An interesting courtyard, an octagon. Again, strong colors, yellow, red. Now a shopping center in Parma from 1979. Who would have thought that this is a shopping center, but that's what it is. Uh, it has uh, its cultural uh, interest and a certain uh, monumentality. As opposed to many so-called modern architects in the second half of the 20th century, Rossi didn't use uh, too much glass, you know, large surfaces of glass. Here, in fact, you don't see any, any, any glass on this, uh, uh, you know, opaque facade. Or look at the towers. Yes, he has sometimes, you know, like here, but all in all, it seems that the windows he prefers are small uh, and uh, he also likes uh, the, the blank uh, walls. A middle school in Brony, uh, 1979, exploring the theme uh, that he already uh, started working with in the, in the earlier project for uh, school. This one is not too dissimilar from the, from the previous project. Well, I would say there is something um, approaching uh, certain kind of architectural infantilism in his architecture. Uh, um, there is um, I called it a, a sophisticated one. And it is sophisticated, but look at this drawing here. This drawing is indeed the drawing of, you know, uh, I don't think too many architecture schools would accept easily this kind of architecture. It would, it would appear as being infantile, you know, and not sufficiently modern. It's primal, but it's primal within a, in, a, in a kind of a infantile way. Although because of the play with the shadows and the light and uh, the articulation of volumes, he, he achieves, achieves a certain kind of modernity, you know, and maybe not a dramatic one, but uh, there is something there, you know, a certain almost dislocation because of the way he articulates the volumes. Look at the plan, perfectly symmetrical. You can get uh, it more symmetrical, you know, it's, it's perfectly symmetrical with two axes uh, and, uh, you know, uh, a square and the square within a square and the circle within the square. So it's, it, it's something that Bruno Zevi would have, uh, would have uh, commented negatively on, I think. But, but think still Aldo Rossi is a modern architect. 
and but exploring something that modernism in general didn't explore the world of the child and and um, there is a certain symbolism here and there is metaphor and uh, there is a realism i i'm thinking of the metaphysical painter giorgio de chirico who also explored uh, at a certain point in, in, in his uh, uh, career as a painter, uh, something that I would say that there is some, there is a, I would say that this is almost a metaphysical architecture. Uh, be, be, I mean, it's very physical, but, but it's very clear. It's, it's symmetrical, it's ordered, but exactly because of it, he achieved some kind of a, uh, um, metaphysical uh, plane, I think. Uh, maybe we can discuss about this, what I might mean through, through using the word metaphysical. It's almost surreal, although it is very, you know, it appears to be very rational. This is kind of a paradox that rationalism becomes surreal in certain circumstances, not always. A monumental tower proposed in 1979, Melbourne, Australia, but he didn't build it. Uh, if I'm uh, if I'm not wrong, is this one here? Uh, the head office of uh, this in Perugia, 1982. Uh, what can we say? Uh, you know. Some people might like it, some people might not like it, but uh, because it is some kind of strange to have on these, uh, you know, tall uh, pillars, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, paradigmatic little infantile house. Uh, yeah, we can, we can discuss about this. But, but you cannot deny the, 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 the unique the uniqueness of this architecture. Although, in a way, nothing is more banal, no? I mean, you know, any child who could draw a house, ask a child to draw a house and the child would draw something like this. But then to place this on top of these very tall uh, supporting elements and uh, with, uh, you know, the, the strong shadows uh, that, that you can see here, it's, it's, it's something else. Maybe there is also a touch of uh, what uh, fascist architecture was about, but, but in a strange way combined with, a, with a, the infantile that I mentioned. So it's, it's a difficult architecture actually, although it appears to be very simple and simplistic. I think it is a difficult one. In 1982, he built this house in the United States he built also in New York, uh, but not a little house. You are going to see it. This is a house uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, again, symmetrical. You might you might say vernacular to an extent, but this is a cultured architecture in the sense that uh, it was done intentionally and not by accident. And uh, is a signature building being. being designed by, by Aldo Rossi. But on the other hand, seems to be connected with what we call, to an extent, the vernacular. Now, some cabins uh, in 1982, you saw already drawings of this. It's, you know, it's the paradigmatic little house that, that he built in various ways. This is just a cabin to be placed on the beach. Then uh, Casa Aurora from 1984, 1987, home of this uh, financial textile group in Turin. Again, the importance of the blank wall, you know, and uh, 
some people might feel uncomfortable about this, but uh, and the small windows that I mentioned, and they appear in Berlin and they appear in uh, many of his works. Small square windows. This is Aldo Rossi. Powerful white round columns. Japan, he built in Japan this building, a palace hotel, 1986-1989. We are dealing here with, uh, with, uh, with the years when postmodernism was, uh, uh, you know, uh, notoriously present almost everywhere. So he didn't renounce being an Italian architect in the second half of the 20th century. But there is a certain, you know, not mysteriousness, but uh, uh, there is something enigmatic almost about this building, which you might say is appropriate for Japan. Sketches, studies. Japan has a lot of important architects itself, but they are still open to other architects to build there. And, and we, I can only appreciate this, that, that Japan is welcoming other architects, although they have plenty of good architects themselves. For the diversity? Pardon? For the diversity? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Romano, diversitate. Pardon? Diversitate. There may be something wrong with me, but maybe I'm tired. I really don't understand what you say. I meant that uh, the Japanese accept these, these architects from the uh, occidental part because they wanted the uh, diversity, isn't it? Well, I guess, I mean, <laughs> but they are quite able to, to do, the, to obtain diversity by themselves. It only shows, uh, it shows that uh, Japan, just like China, is uh, appreciating uh, important architecture from other, other parts of the world and gives them a chance to, uh, gives a chance to the architects to, to build in their country. And this kind of openness other countries do not have. But it's something which I applaud both in China and Japan, South Korea as well. Um, you know, it's 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 a good thing, I think, to to with all the risks, because you might say this building is how well, does it connect with the other buildings? Well, maybe it doesn't connect, but then why does it need to connect? You know, you could have harmony through contrast. Symmetry again. A drawing of the building. Again, the drawings for Aldo Rossi are very important. And uh, I see no contradiction actually between the, the drawings and, uh, and the built work is they have the same spirit. If he would have done a commercial rendering here, maybe the spirit of that commercial end, uh, rendering, if it had a spirit, would have been different from the spirit of the built work. But this frontal view, you know, uh, done in this way is sufficiently relevant to tell the truth about the building. It doesn't need a commercial rendering, in my opinion. It's truer to the spirit of the work in this way, as you can see for yourselves.
So what I'm trying to say is there are, uh, there are many ways to represent a, an architectural work. We don't have to use uh, you know, just the prescribed uh, perspectival uh, uh, drawings. It's, it's possible to do in many ways. You know, you, you, you can, I mean, in my opinion, again, this kind of drawing is very, very relevant for what the building is. I don't need to see it in three dimensions. I, if I see this, I understand what the building is about. And here it is. The frontality is very important. It's true. He doesn't play with, uh, you know, in, uh, in uh, you know, extravagant ways with volumes. He doesn't do that. This, it's almost like a mask. This frontal elevation is everything about this building. In this sense, it's actually very Japanese. Uh, sorry, I, I uh, uh, what did I do here? Sorry, I, I pressed the wrong, uh, wrong button. Uh, I have to go back to, okay, fortunately I found it rather quickly. Okay. Uh, A lighthouse theater in Toronto. Uh, this one uh, I couldn't find. Uh, it's it's Estil Aldo Rossi. Uh, Estil Aldo Rossi with this kind of uh, theatrical architecture, almost model like. This is the building, but you you might say this could have been the model. The distance between the model and the built work is actually very short and the frontier is rather thin. Um, there are dangers here because, you know, a building should be more than a model or shouldn't look like a model. But his architecture is, uh, is um, accommodating this kind of uh, similarity between the model and the building. There is perhaps a level of artificiality. This is not an organic architecture. It's not an architecture that grows from the earth upwards as uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, asked. No, it's, it's an architecture that, uh, that is uh, conceived in the head of the, the architect and landed in this case here in, 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 in Canada. But it could have been in other places as well. A monument uh, to Sandro Pertini. I don't know who Sandro Pertini is in Milan. We already know the paradigmatic triangle with all the sides equal and uh, water runs through it. And it's, it's, it's Aldo Rossi through and through. Uh, we see the amphitheater just as we saw in that school where all the children were, uh, you know, sitting on this. Uh, uh, you know, these steps. This is a monument, but it has this side which, uh, you know, is open towards the city. And, uh, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, these walls, in a way, for my taste, they are a little bit uh, harsh. You know, they separate, uh, they are open only on one side, but uh, I don't know. Anyway, this is how he did it because he loves primal geometries. Look, it's a cube. That's what it is. It's a cube. But it is engaging and it is, although it is rather misanthropic almost. I mean, the amphitheater is open on one side towards the city, but then the other three sides are, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, uh, could. Um, could uh, generate some claustrophobia, perhaps. Apartments, <clears throat> he built a lot in uh, 1989 in the Netherlands in Hague, quite a big uh, apartment building. He loves these long, uh, uh, long buildings uh, interrupted by, by these powerful verticals. 
but all in all, it's, a, it's another long building uh, that uh, Aldo Rossi built. And it is, you look at these buildings on, in, the, in the, you know, at the horizon almost, uh, you know, the one by Aldo Rossi does have personality. It has presence. You know, these are rather anonymous, but not his. And I think it has a certain elegance and a certain monumentality, but, but it's not a crushing monumentality because of various things, the, the use of color, uh, you know, it's, it's well balanced. I don't think he falls into, the, into that, uh, uh, you know, uh, crushing uh, uh, monumentality that uh, Ricardo Bofill arrived at in, in his works uh, near Paris. Now here, Aldo Rossi remains, uh, it's kind of a relax, relaxed monumentality, if I can call it so. Although the building is, 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 a, is a big one. Residential building and former industrial area in Italy, 1990-1992. Uh, <clears throat> we see some elements here that uh, are borrowed from other projects. We just saw that uh, monument in Milan. Here we see again, I don't know if water, I guess water is supposed to run through this too. Well, even good architects repeat themselves sometimes. Um, what, can we do? what can we do? Even the Corbusier wanted to multiply his Le Cabanon uh, in <laughs> many times. He didn't do it, but he wanted to. And uh, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright also, you can see his price tower in the Broadacre City project. Uh, and so, you know, it's almost unavoidable to, to you know, as, as uh, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright was uh, once asked, uh, was reproached, why are you coating uh, um, so much? Uh, and he said, I quote, but I quote from myself. So quote, quotations from yourself are sometimes unavoidable. Uh, and so, you know, even the best architects cannot continuously and continuously and continuously uh, invent, uh, invent something. Now the triangle here seems to be gone. Now, I don't know if it was uh, vandalized or not. Uh, right now, as it looks kind of strange, what is there compared to the, compared to, uh, to the model. It's a citadel, it's a fortress. Is it supposed to be a fortress? I told you that he loves the world. He likes the, the opaque world, the blank world. Now, I don't know to make this kind of introversion that the three buildings on the on, on three sides opening towards a court and then towards the street to be uh, you know almost uh, adverse towards uh, anyone who wants to approach it it's like a fortress in a way clubhouse of the cosmopolitan golf club in tirrenia in pisa 1990 what can we say? This is for uh, the rich and famous, so to speak. You know, it's not for everybody. It's, um, you know, it's a club. It's a club. This is not uh, for uh, ouvriers. It's not for proletarians. An administrative building for the Walt Disney Company in Orlando, Florida. Why he had to work for this? Of course, uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, you know a lucrative uh, commission, but uh, I don't know. I anyway, this is what he built for Walt Disney. Again, the triangle, but no water is running through it. A contemporary art center on the island of uh, this Beaumont du Lac uh, in France, 1991. 
this is the project as we know by now how he draws and this is the building sorry for the resolution here you see it kind of better sorry for the alami uh, words spread all over the picture uh, this 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 company takes nice picture pictures but uh, then it ruins them with with its name to protect its um, so called authorship you know it's uh, everywhere even on the sky as if they did the that sky you know as if it is their work even the building is not their work you know so uh, i could have placed just one one word uh, somewhere you know Anyway, this is the building in France by, um, by Aldo Rossi. A cloudy sky there, the rain approaching. Uh, well, there is a certain mannerism here, and uh, you know, probably he himself was not very happy about it, but anyway. Uh, post office and apartments near the city of music in Paris, uh, 1991. But 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 although you might say he is not truly a contextualist, here you might see some references to Mansart. You know, to I mean, there is a there is a reference to uh, to to Paris. I don't know about this, but what is above? Yes. Another long, long building. This was his language. This is his language. The Netherlands. This is kind of interesting. Uh, you see, it's an observatory from 1990. Uh, this. Uh, this uh, observatory, it is still uh, very much Aldo Rossi, but still a little bit different. The windows are as they are, you know, <laughs> you know, smaller and smaller towards the top, sorry. Uh, yeah, in the Netherlands. A country which itself has great architects, but just like uh, Japan and China and South Korea, they invite important architects to also build in the Netherlands. And I think they do the right thing because, you know, there is no need really for an excessive nationalist. Uh, it's better, I think, to be open and to invite, uh, you know, other opinions, so to speak. This is the model of the building. Symmetrical again, of course. Interesting, this uh, doorway. You know. It took me a while to, to understand what is going on here. It's because you might have the feeling that this is not in a vertical plane, but it is. Now, this is where little windows, they are truly the opposite of, of the windows used by uh, Le Corbusier and the windows used by Frank Lloyd Wright. Although Le Corbusier in Le Cabanon, that little building, uh, uh, he uses small windows like, like those found in vernacular architectures. But, uh, you know, uh, Villa Savoie didn't have such windows, of course. Uh, nor Frank Lloyd Wright with his, uh, you know, quest for horizontality and breaking the corners. 
this building also has something of a fortress, you know, uh, not to say even prison. You know, it's, it's very, very strict and blank walls Symmetry and symmetry and symmetry again. What is not symmetrical here is the cloud. The clouds are not symmetrical, but the building is very much so. In essence, Aldo Rossi operates with a rather limited uh, number of uh, architectural uh, forms or paradigms. You know, you can count them using the fingers of your both hands, if not one single hand. But he obtains a variety using using them. Look at this stair here, you know, it's a monumental one. I mean, look at the elevator, it's, it's almost lost here in its insignificance. But the stair is the one that governs the whole composition, it's the spine of the building. And at the top, uh, you know, uh, the, the room of fantasy. I don't know if he did this um, decorative work on the walls or someone else, probably someone else. But he provided the background, meaning the architecture. So he's in the Netherlands here. Um, so we saw buildings by him in various countries, Japan, France, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Italy, of course. This is the stair that we saw in the plan between two blank walls. Another hotel in Japan, uh, different somehow from the other one. What is interesting is that uh, Peter, that uh, Aldo Rossi was also invited to teach at the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies in New York that was uh, founded by um, Peter Reisenman uh, Peter Eisenman, even, I mean, the, the Institute have also published, I know of one book by Aldo Rossi in the series under the name Oppositions. Uh, Aldo Rossi was also interested in urban matters. So you would say the field of an urbanist. Um, and uh, but what I'm saying is, uh, you know, Eisenman was one of the seven uh, deconstructivists. Aldo Rossi was not in any way a deconstructivist, but uh, because of his significance in architecture, he was invited to teach in that school, with, which was run by, um, I mean, he was the director, um, Peter Eisenman. But there, there were other people involved there, like Rem Polkas, Kenneth Frampton, and others. And by the way, uh, 
it seems, uh, Peter Eisenman brought uh, Kenneth Frampton to the States. And Kenneth Frampton was actually the, the second man, so to speak, uh, of that school, a famous school at the time in Manhattan, the Institute of Architecture and Urban Plan, uh, the, the Institute of Architecture and Urbanism, I think, or Urban Studies. A little school, a very little. A uh, shopping center in Sardinia, 1997. Again, monumentality where, of a certain kind which you wouldn't really expect when it comes to shopping centers. And look at those two white columns. I, I, I'm not totally uh, applauding those white columns, but here they have this, uh, uh, you know, whimsical. Um, presence in the in the world they they are not really necessary structurally i imagine in no way but they have a decorative element and but they are also transformed they are not copied you know as dory columns or ionic or corinthian so i guess they could be accepted although i'm a little bit uh, turned off by uh, postmodern uh, uh, you know references But there is some kind of an interplay here between austerity and delight. On the right, austerity. On the left, some kind of a delight, you know, and playing in a decorative way with columns and these horizontal bands of two different colors, if we are to think of white being a color too, although it is not. So ornamentation is not totally absent. I mean, this is ornamentation, you know, this. They cannot be described, these stripes cannot be described otherwise. The Scholastic Corporation, 2001, um, so he died in 1999. This was completed two years after he, de he died. But the project was already approved and uh, the construction probably already started. When, when he died. Uh, this is the building. And uh, what can we say? Here he uses more glass because he's in Manhattan and he's uh, you know, trying to relate to some other buildings, although here he uses more glass than the neighbors, but it's okay. Um, so this was finalized after his tragic death. So we are, we are now in Manhattan in New York City. So his building is here. Here is written 2001. Um, yeah, it is 2001, but it doesn't say that you know he, he he died. Perhaps they should have said that he died in 1999. Anyway, it is in Soho, in the south of uh, the southern southern part of, of, of Manhattan. Well, whoever made this try to uh, romanticize a little bit, uh, you know, the 
connection with the, with the next building. <clears throat> I personally don't see really so much uh, connection. In fact, uh, the building by Rossi is in good measure self-referential. You know, here it says deeply recessed curtain walls. To me, I, these don't seem to me to be deeply recessed at all. And, um, you know, same colors used. I don't know where are the white columns here. I don't see them. Anyway, uh, someone tried to see some kind of a correspondence between the building by Rossi, the scholastic building, and the little Zinger building. Uh, anyway, this is not, you know, this analysis was not, uh, uh, was not uh, Aldo Rossi's. Thank you, and happy happy birthday, uh, Aldo Rossi. <clears throat>